Hi, everyone. I think this is going to be a really fun panel talking about <laughs> Shakespeare. Um, so I think we have some photos of the Marin Shakespeare uh, Company to show. But Leslie, let's start with you. Why did you start this program? Well, I run a Shakespeare theater. And I love Shakespeare and I love putting on plays. And we have lots of education programs where we share our love of Shakespeare with kids. 15 years ago, we decided San Quentin Prison's just five minutes from our theater. Why don't we try to start a Shakespeare class there? And that's how I got started with Shakespeare in prison. And the photos that you see are actors in different California state prisons um, taking classes and performing Shakespeare. So, Damien, someone comes to you when you're in prison and says, hey, they're doing Shakespeare. Do you want to get involved? <laughs> was, that, was that easy? <laughs> yes? Um, I had absolutely no interest in that. Um, my interest only extended to signing the list so that other people who were interested could do it. And the day that the uh, Duckets came out to attend the classes, I wasn't going to go, and a good friend of mine asked me to go with him to the building. I said, well, I'll go with you to the building, but I'm not going in. <laughs> so when I went to the building, we had delayed so long that the unlock had been completed, so we couldn't get in. So now, essentially, you're out of bounds. Now, being out of bounds, one of the worst guards there to see you out of bounds saw us, and he started to beeline directly at us, and it was about halfway there. And Leslie unlocked the door. So <laughs> I went in. <laughs> she saves lives, by the way. She's a superhero. Y'all just don't. Oh, I told y'all. So, so you went in. Did you just sit there and think, you know, I'm just going to watch? Or did you start participating right away? Uh, no. I sit there in shock that this small, brave white lady. <laughs> In this room full of men who had done some horrible things in the past and who had blood anger between the many of the men in the room. She was there in this four corner room alone, no guard, no guns with a whistle or panic button. And I wasn't afraid that anyone was going to do anything to her. Contrary to popular opinion, prisoners are not animals. They wouldn't do anything to her. But if something had happened amongst them, her body's small. So the flailing could have caused great damage. So <laughs> I thought that no one was going to stay. And I certainly was sure that no one would come back. And that was not the case. It started off with a lot of reticence on the part of the men there. Men had a welded mask for their survival on their faces for decades. And to have someone come in out of nowhere and say, make a sound like a bird, <laughs> just does not fit the G code. <laughs> so, so you're not quick to do that. And that's what I thought it was really going to be a disaster. I did. <laughs> so Maverick, what about you? Were you skeptical at first or were you all in from the beginning? Hmm. I don't know. Um, I would like to say that I was already all in because... A good friend of mine by the name of Nate Collins, who was still trapped behind the walls, uh, he said, man, bro, just come through. You've been acting an ass all your life. You might as well do it on the stage. <laughs> mm, you may have a point. No, I was all in from, from day one because a lot of my, my bros in there, they was already doing it. And I was like, I had just uh, gotten out of a... Uh, a dysfunctional relationship with another group there and I was looking for a home <laughs> and of course Leslie yes she's not a white woman she's a woman of color <laughs> she's one of the chosen people and so my Jewish mother uh, said hey come on in okay now um, let this other guy carry you and act like a baby what oh what? But uh, it was good to just be able to oh, just unburden myself from all the stresses outside that door because inside it was a magical place where I could be a kid, I could be a butterfly, I could be a baby, I could be Mark Antony, I could be Prince pretending to be Ariel 
in a tribute to Prince. <laughs> the Tempest, a tribute to Prince. Yes, I could do all that only because she gives me license to do things that can't nobody else do. Because she's seen something in me uh, and she cultivated and molded and motivated a whole bunch of things in me that a lot of other people, my family, friends, whatever, tried to suppress in me. And it caused me to be someone who I didn't want to be. And so I could be my authentic, true self in there. So, of course, I was open to it. So, Leslie, we've heard uh, they act like you have them act like babies. We have them make <laughs> sounds like birds. How do you get people like Damien who are maybe a little skeptical? Um, how do you get them to open up? How do you get people to really participate? Well, one of the things we do is laugh together, just like we in this room have been doing already. And we do a lot of drama therapy inspired exercises that involve self reflection, self expression, teamwork, creative problem solving. And we delve into Shakespeare text and look at the themes and characters closely in those plays. So we get to talk about um, things like why the character Macbeth decides to commit a murder or why a group of men uh, band together uh, to kill Julius Caesar. And we get to do that through talking about Shakespeare. And we're always relating Shakespeare to our own lives, which characters do we relate to? What themes in the play do we relate to? So there's a lot of positive energy that gets built and a lot of um, sneaky therapy that <laughs> happens through this somatic work of actually pretending to feel different things. And in an environment where often closing off your feelings and not expressing feelings is necessary to protect your safety when you have when you're invited to then pretend to feel awe or curiosity or wonder or gratitude um, something opens inside of you physically and spiritually and change happens yeah. so do you mean you know you, you can hear the argument people in prison shouldn't get privileges or they shouldn't get this kind of a treat, but it sounds like there. This has really amazing outcomes. So, can you talk a little bit about why this is a good idea to offer this in prisons? Well, first, we're dealing with human beings, hmm. and with human beings, we have to recognize our responsibility to one another. It doesn't matter that a person has gone afoul to the law. In many cases, those things are clear cut. In some cases, they aren't so clear. It was once legal to have me in chattel slavery. So by that standard, then the fact that I should not receive anything because I was a slave, it's justified because it's the, it's the normal accepted policy of the city, the state. And your property. So when we say they, we're sloughing off the responsibility of what we have to humanity. Most men, women incarcerated are coming home. Now, if I'm going to prepare someone for correction or rehabilitation or habilitation, because in many cases, people have not been habilitated to begin with. And if a person does not realize that a person is not conscious of the fact that we have at least two Americas here. My reality is different from your reality. So to those who say that, I would say they need to really ask themselves, why do they need the prisoner? Why do they need the N-word? There's something in you that need that. So when you identify that, maybe you can start seeing how we're blended together and how your labor towards me is actually a benefit towards you. Because when I come home, I would really like to be a great neighbor to you and not a predator to you. So if I'm building a social institution to create rehabilitation, I am starting with the premise that that is who I am. And I want to afford them the same opportunities that I would want myself because soon they're coming and I want to be able to welcome this person. When we start viewing it like that 
and not looking at it as they, we'll be able to achieve these things. But as long as we allow those people who design these things to lay that clear line and get the rest of these people to follow suit, that there is an us and there is them, we will all suffer. So Maverick, I personally find Shakespeare a little bit difficult mm. sometimes. Um, he's a very dead white guy. Yeah, um, that's true. <laughs> what to you, doing Shakespeare in prison, what, what spoke to you or what helped, what, what in Shakespeare was resonated with you when you performed these plays? Well, <clears throat> initially when I was uh, of your mind frame, nothing at all. Um, <laughs> I thought I was just being cast as a pretty boy because I kept getting typecast as the boyfriend, the the husband, and and I stated it. But then when they actually say, "Okay, you think you tough? All right, huh? Take this." I was like, "Oh, okay. I don't want it. Let me." And I was able to see the backstory of this person, and I was able to see that this person uh, went through the same uh, betrayal, the same love, the same envy, the same hatred as I did. All the things like. My role as Mark Anthony, for instance, that is when I develop an affinity for Shakespeare because he talks about the human condition. But not only that, he spoke about the human condition all those centuries ago. Well, yeah. And so in that, uh, I could see that if he was going through these things at this time and I'm going through these things in this time, maybe... I can use this as a venue or a way to uh, process all these traumas that he went through and that I'm presently going through. So it, 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 it didn't make me, it made me want to look at uh, why versus what, because society has been conditioned to look at, oh, what did he do? Oh, he killed someone, not why would a 19-year-old kid participate in something as heinous as murder? Not why did he go left when he was supposed to go right? And so Shakespeare helped me to see why I used to feel the need to put on all these masks and please all these people. You know, so it helped me. Damien, was there a character or play that really spoke to you personally? Oh, certainly a couple. The first... Macduff and Macbeth was uh, very personal to me because I was a person who was incarcerated uh, in my early 20s. I left behind a wife and children. Macduff was a person who left his wife and children behind in a venomous state, a venomous condition whereby he knew that the antagonist uh, Macbeth was on to him. So he knew that his family was in danger. I had an upbringing from very conscious, loving parents. I was taught very early on the importance of presence with your children, the importance of the presence with your wife. And Macduff made a decision to step away from that. And my actions created the same condition that I stepped away from mine. So it was very somatic working with that scene to whereby when, when Macduff asks any news of my family, he knows there's something wrong. Intricately, he knows it. And when he finds out that they've been murdered, he's hurt, but he knew. When I found out the things that my children were going through while I was inside, I was hurt, but I knew what they were going, I knew the venomous state of this country, my kind, my children. So I drew upon a lot of things from that. I couldn't help but do it because it, it extracted that memory out of me. Um, working with Othello, when I performed that role, I was, uh, I was told by many people that I had not been acting long enough to carry such a complex character. 
but I always felt that I've been living long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's what I believed. And, and I had long gotten over defining myself by other people's limitations. And I believe that that helped me. And it was rather vindicating because I had an opportunity to, to play that in the eighth grade. But because I was in Tennessee, as soon as the parents found out that it was going to be a little black boy and a little white girl simulating love and murder, and that disappeared. It just quietly disappeared. It was never spoken of again. So having the opportunity to perform it again, I believe I said to Leslie, after we had performed uh, Macbeth, she said, is there anything that you'd like to do? I said, one day I would like to be able to perform Othello, but not just perform it, but to really pull it off, to really pull it off. And uh, I was afforded that opportunity. Uh, thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Damien was able to perform Othello at the Marin Shakespeare Company um, once he got out of, of prison, which is, yeah. and he, he got won, rave reviews. Won the Bay Area Theater. Critic Circle Award for Best Actor in the Bay yeah. Area for 2016. <laughs> Damn right. Yeah. Next. Um, I'm going to throw it to the audience for questions in a sec. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, Leslie, I want to ask, um, it can't be easy to bring programs like this to prisons just in terms of regulations and funding. What, what needs to happen to get this program, um, a program like it, in more places. There are a lot of barriers to bringing programs into prisons, but California is right now leading the nation in offering rehabilitative programs in prisons. And that's, and it's to be commended for that. There's a lot more that could happen. And what I find is that the upper echelon of people at the CDCR, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, believe in these programs and support them. But Officers who we meet on a day-to-day -day basis don't always believe that rehabilitation is possible and they don't always support the programs. So I think one thing that could happen in California is for the CDCR to really train all of their staff that rehabilitation is possible. And we know that these staff have very high rates of suicide, divorce, substance abuse, very low life expectancies. So if the staff in our prisons believed that they were contributing to rehabilitation, I think that they would have um, a better sense of their own job purpose and that they would be happier and live longer. Our prisons would be better for everyone. And of course, I'd love to see lots of other states um, emulate what California is doing in terms of rehabilitative programming. Um, we have a question right here in the front. Hi, my name is Gloria Berry. I'm founder of Berry Hall for Ladies. Um, I worked at San Quentin and I know the importance of programs and getting out that sale. My question is, um, would one of you, if one of the people who are so interested in philanthropy and, and giving back, be interested in expanding these programs into the juvenile centers and even um, after school programs locally? Well, most definitely because uh, thanks to my uh, performing arts mother, Leslie, <laughs> uh, she has cultivated a dream of mine and it's create a a performing arts academy. It would be called the Magic Academy of Performing Arts. Magic stands for Music, Arts, and Guidance Influences Change. We will focus on three areas, music, uh, acting, and uh, theater, and contemporary movement, and dance. Those areas will be under the scopes of music therapy, drama therapy, and talk therapy. In this, we will get a chance to change the world because us, at the age we are right now, we can't change no minds. However, we can mold the minds who are gonna take care of us and who we're gonna lead this planet to. So if we counteract all the negative influences that all the, all the littles, all the, that little Wayne created, and uh, people, you know, <laughs> what music and media is doing to our kids today, uh, then we'll have a chance. But to answer your question, yes, yes, ma'am. Damien and I currently co-teach um, in two youth correctional facilities, um, and we have other programs, and we are very interested in expanding this work and seeing how this work can benefit more people. Well, and I wonder, too, if um, this work could benefit people before they're incarcerated, right? Yeah. You see arts funding cut across the country. Do you think, you know, um, 
increasing drama programs or, or in high schools or in middle schools, would, would that be helpful as well? Would that have been helpful for you, Damien? <laughs> I, I think that it would be helpful. I believe that a lot of things that we see today that we tend to have a problem with is the result of voices and expression being suppressed. And I think that when you provide art as an outlet for young people, it also allows them an opportunity to develop who they are. I think that it's no accident that the powers that be oftentimes take away from the artists. It, we know the power of art. We know that in many dictatorial company, uh, countries, the first people to be exiled are the artists. It is the artist's responsibility to hurl in the time that has come and to usher out the time that is done. People know the power of art and the transformative power of art. So I think that we should really hold their feet to the fire to create that avenue because we are losing children because we're depriving them of that. And if we're going to be responsible, we cannot accept cynic uh, politicians because I don't believe that a politician should be a cynic. He should believe in the change that the people need, that the people cry for. He should take it seriously. And I think the first sign of a get out politician is when he starts to express cynical statements. You're done. We have to get rid of things like that. We need to make a way clear for the children. Well, speaking of the power of art, we're going to have Maverick perform right now. So the three of us are going to get out of your way, and uh, we're going to see a performance from Maverick. Get me. Get me. Get me. It's, it's, it's I got already I got Oh. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone who came in the room today. Uh, you all are a part of change. Y'all may not even know it. Uh, this piece that I'm doing now wasn't supposed to be the one. Uh, however, thanks, James. Where yet? James? Oh, did he leave? Okay. <laughs> however, it, this is called How Did We Get Here? And it's talking about how did we get here as uh, far as the school to prison pipeline? How do we get here as far as uh, racism, police brutality, everything? This place built by mixed race once welcomed the world's unwanted masses. Now it incarcerates its lower classes while giving invisible lashes on the backs of those uprooted from utopias turned war torn. It's tragic. The sheer diversity of slaves passed by masters, same establishment enslaved my race, now doing it with taxes. Asians and Latinos, some call you others, but I choose to call you brother because I feel and know your struggle. In this land of milk and honey, an immigrant Shangri-La. America was formed by foreigners. Now they want to kick us out. All the while, society is breeding inner city animals, forced to enforce situations the young minds can't handle. A child born is a provider. Damn. Lack of understanding leads to run-ins with rivals. While society's going to write them off a while and out for show, give them a life sentence and lock his life behind prison doors. Fresh from school halls, who are we to blame? This the reason why society is in such disarray. But there's a ray of light to light the way and lead the world into a brighter day. <laughs> Watch what I say. When we come together forever to weather the storm, social awareness and all fairness, we here to change the norm. Started with laws, voted on the ballots. Together our voices heard over the crying and shouting. Release our men back into the lion's den. Maybe then our young bull elephants can learn from them and our urban jungles can become a home again and we can go back to focusing on home again. No more wars within. America's shores is clear how we got here. This just food for thought about how do we get there? But how did we get here? Uh, as of lately, I've been contemplating just what life means. Compile that with the many horrors that I've seen and faced in my lifetime. Sometimes I have to ask the Lord, why do our little daughters have to cry from the loss of their dad's life before we get right? Huh? How many had to die with their hands in the sky in a cold, dark night that's so cold? Especially when the arm of the Lord take your breath like a chokehold. It's so horrible to be young and black because the odds is definitely stacked not in your favor. Wrong color on the wrong face at the wrong place. So sad. We'll see you later. When will this all end? When citizens begin to sin against the men in blue. Ooh. Tell me what we're going to do. Tell me how do we get through? This state of fear in which our state is currently in. 
When will the men who live within learn discriminatism, lies, and racism? Is it them or is it me? Who's to blame for society's woes and oh no's, oh no's, senseless bullet holes through the souls of innocence? Through the souls of innocence, through the souls of innocence that leads to mindless funerals. Let's go. It's time to cross that divide. Together we'll stand, separated we'll all die. Open your eyes and realize that all lives matter. Because when a child is killed, regardless of race, another mother dreams is shattered. And instead of addressing the problem, the news promotes the hate. Instead of giving us a solution to help save our human race. What will it take? Huh? What will it take? Huh? Ask yourself. What will it take? Thank you.